Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a Triad production. I'm Dr. Graham Taylor. Today's podcast is the first in a series geared towards early career practitioners and those working with ECPs. In this series, we'll be talking with seasoned therapists asking them what they've learned in their own private practices or group work. We'll be exploring with them the unique experiences they've had, specific issues they've identified for ECPs to consider, the various patient populations they've worked with, and we'll be collecting along the way from them their experiential gems that they'd like to pass on to our upcoming colleagues. To kick off this ECP series, we have Dr. Aaron Elmore joining us as we talk about ECPs working with children. Erin is a licensed psychologist whose practice is based in San Diego, California, and her focus is with children, teens, and young adults. She's also a test prep expert in the broader triad family, and we've had her on our show before and are so happy to have her back. Erin, welcome to the show. Thank you. Really happy to be here. Nice to have you here. You know, as I mentioned in the intro, you are in private practice, primary focus with children, young, mm-hmm. young adults. Tell us about your experience with private practice and coming into it, just to set the framework for our time today. Yes, so I've been licensed for coming up on four years and also in private practice for those years. So I started right out of licensure. And the first year I was at a group practice as basically an independent contractor just to get the lay of the land a little bit. And then I had my own private practice for the past three years. And as you mentioned, it specializes with children and teens. And also recently I've added in college students as well. So up to about age 25. Yeah. That's kind of a nice extension. You're starting, starting kind of young, but I I think one of the kind of a really exciting group to work with are young people going into college that kind of that 18, 19, 20, up to 25. It's really an exploratory time. They're individuating, you know, in their own lives. They're kind of finding themselves trying to separate in good individuating ways. It's helpful, but to have someone kind of guide us through that time, it's a really a learning process for them, isn't it? To discover who am I? What am I coming out of? What do I, what do I want to identify as myself? And in the same way that when we go into our teenage years, our peers become important. As we go into these young adult years, our peers are becoming important as we identify who we are as well. So that's got to be some fun work with that age group. Exactly. And I think especially the upcoming generations are having a harder time transitioning to adulthood. And as we know, the brain doesn't fully finish developing till mid twenties anyway. So there's a lot of adolescent overlap in a way. Yeah. So I really enjoy that age group. I find sometimes when I'm working with uh, teens and their parents, I'll tell them, you know, for, and and, and elementary school kids, I'm telling the parents that for a while you are their frontal lobe. (laughs) You're helping, (laughs) you're helping them understand reasoning, logic, you know, logic, judgment, all those kinds of things. And until they kind of grow into it, I would imagine that you work with these young people that you're kind of frontal lobing some of these things too, as you help them kind of develop theirs more and more. Definitely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You tell me about the theoretical perspective that you work from. There's different theories. What do you work from in terms of your perspective and how did you kind of nail that down? Because I'm going to ask you a question about that later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was trained from a family systems perspective, which is a little bit of a misnomer. It's basically systems. So looking Mm -hmm. at interpersonal, intrapersonal macrosystemic. So I, I conceptualize from all of those pieces. So with kids and teens, that usually means thinking about how they're doing at school. Also what's going on with the family, what's going on with their siblings, as well as what's going on individually. And then when I treat, it's usually from a combination of interpersonal therapy, as well as CBT. I find that interpersonal helps to get to the root of the problem and really pay attention to what's happening underneath the content but then, you know, kids and teens and even, even college age people sometimes just need practical tips, skills, coping skills. And so that's where my CBT influence comes in. Very so it's cool. really a kind of a combination of those two. Mm-hmm. Really good. You know, as you're talking about that piece, you're in private practice now, you said you were in a group practice. Share with us your path that brought you into child therapy, private practice. And have you found that there are some aspects of private practice that you might encourage ECPs to consider as unique to private practice versus say working in a clinic or a group practice or mental health centers you mentioned before where your start was? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I never really knew I would end up in private practice. (laughs) I know some people that I remember from grad school, they'd have things planned out like five steps in advance, you know, six years down the line. And for me, I really just sort of picked the next thing that sounded right for me through my training. Uh So that's, that's just my experience. But 
I, I realized by the time I was ready to get licensed that I really liked being my own boss. I liked being in charge of my own schedule. Yes. <laughs> um, I liked being able to decide, you know, what types of clients I wanted to see. Cause you know, when you're in training, you don't That's really right. have much say over that, which is good. Cause right. you get a lot of experience, but I, I had a better sense when I was licensed of, or getting ready to be licensed, what type of clients I really wanted to see. And it seemed like private practice was the best place to be in charge of all of those things. Yeah. So I think it was, I have a little bit of like a business person in me. And so I think I was drawn to the setting for that reason. And I value work-life balance a lot. I know, I know a lot of psychologists do and and some don't as much, but I didn't want to be working like 40 to 60 hours a week. And I still needed to make a living. So being able to set my own fees with private practice clients just seemed like a win, win, win. Yeah. That's really good. I was drawn to that. Yeah. I find that that's probably one of the most attractive things is the autonomy, the Mm -hmm. choice, that work-life balance that we get to be accountable for and responsible for. We're also responsible on the other end. You know, we don't have a salary paycheck coming in. We don't maybe have insurance coverage through a group practice. And so a lot of those and things that the pluses around the autonomy, choice, life balance. The other side is I've got to be accountable for some really managing my money in good ways and my finances in good ways. Yeah. But it's really, did you find this out of curiosity? I worked within a hospital for about seven years and I was doing a little kind of a private practice part-time and then my private practice grew as it does. And so I had to move out of the, the hospital setting where I was also part-time because it was part-time hospital, probably three-quarter time private practice getting to be too much. So I wanted to go full-time. Did you find that that leap into private practice took a little bit of faith? Oh, I was so nervous. Yes. <laughs> Especially being newly licensed because I, I know, right? Like, I yeah, I like the safety net of supervision and having somebody to check in on me. Um, right. I, I mean, I was ready for a little more independence by the time I was licensed, but yes, I was yeah. very nervous and it was a big leap to immediately get licensed and then be fully on my own. Yeah. So I actually, I think the first six months I actually paid somebody to function as a supervisor because I was just too nervous. Yeah. So it was, it was essentially consultation because obviously was I was good. operating under my own license, but I just needed little handholding <laughs> to make sure yeah. I was setting everything up correctly. But yes, that was a little nerve wracking to not have a structure or a system in place. I was the system. I was my own structure, but I learned, I, I reflected on what was helpful in grad school and sort of yeah. recreated that as much as I could to launch into private practice. Yeah. You, Aaron, you bring up something really good right here. I'd like to kind of highlight on, you know, when we make that leap, if those are going to go from a group practice or a community practice, whatever it may be, and they're looking to go into private practice, most people will start private practice on a, on a small part-time basis, mm-hmm. one, two, three, four, but you know, patients, and then they'll kind of expand. And then they see, can I do this? And am I going to get referrals? Am, and am, am I good in a private practice setting? Do I like it? Do I like all the things that come with it? Like the billing and the, you know, the insurance, you know, panels, all those things that are kind of already ready made when you're working for a clinic or a group practice where you just kind of step in and, you know, add water and mix. It's pretty easy, but in private practice, you're, you're, you're doing it all wearing a lot of hats. And while it can be very good, sometimes that leap, like you're saying, is a little, is a little kind of uh, nerve wracking. I love the idea of encouraging ECPs to think about bringing alongside them in that time, a consultant, uh, a mentor, a colleague, kind of an upperclassman colleague to kind of run some things by and kind of help hold us in that time. That's not like that was a really good decision on your part in hindsight. Yes. Yes. And it just came out of my nervousness, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but right. yeah, I think there's a lot of ways that can happen or different forms that can take. It could be informal consultation, like reaching out to past supervisors and saying, Hey, I'm, I'm going on my own. Can I just call you every once in a while? And they may be fine with that. In yeah. my case, I was doing some testing and I, I just wanted a little more like somebody to look over my reports before I signed them. And so I ended up basically hiring somebody to do that and sort of hold my hand through certain cases. And then when, when I felt like I didn't need it anymore, we moved on, but it could, it could also be forming a consultation group. So that's one other thing I ended up doing. It didn't start right away, but I found a couple other child psychologists, teen psychologists, one did testing, one worked in inpatient. And then I was an, I was outpatient private practice. And so we still meet actually it's been years, but we still meet about once a month and compare cases. And that has been a huge source of support. So when there's a crisis or just, you know, something's bothering me and I need to run it by somebody, I have people to do that with. So I think there's a lot of forms you can create your own support with when you're in private practice. And I think it's necessary because otherwise it is daunting and and overwhelming sometimes. I think it's a great encouragement. I think it's really professionally responsible, but also kind of part of our good Mm self-care as we're taking that step. You know, it's, it it is a lead, but you know, and, and and we're going to do it. Most are successful in it. We actually, I've got a colleague 
that I do with her a kind of an ECP group, started with ECP group. They've matured into these really great clinicians and they actually become our referral sources now when we get referrals that we can't take ourselves. And, yeah. But it's been wonderful. Like you said, it's been a couple of years and to have them come in and we were teaching them kind of a psychodynamic uh, theoretical framework in the context we have case presentations and that we meet every other week. But having that context where there are other people out there doing something similar that we're doing kind of takes one to know one sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's fun to kind of go through it together, isn't it? And it sounds like that's what's similar and, and what you decided to do as well. Nicely done. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I, I'm proud of my younger self for doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. It is, you know, there's, there's a learning curve as we start out in private practice, you know, like we're talking about right now. What are some of the lessons that you found yourself having to learn on your own, maybe outside of your schooling? Mm -hmm. And was there anything in particular that surprised you about coming into private practice? Yes, I think that the biggest thing I had to learn was all the business aspects of private practice. So how to deal with insurance, how to keep records of your billing, even sometimes that you have to draft your own forms and your own paperwork, mm -hmm. just all of those things. We were trained clinically on those, or at least I was yes. trained clinically on those, but not really from a business mind, even things like taxes, or do you set up an LLC or an S corp? And how, you know, how do you deal with highs and lows of clientele versus, you know, like summer, for example, is very low clientele, but then fall and um, right. spring things usually pick up. So just managing all of the business aspects was something that I had to learn on the go, if you will. Um, yeah. And I think what helped me the most with that was working for a group practice first, as I had mentioned. So I, I was only responsible for the client work, which I felt comfortable doing, but I was really asking a lot of questions of our That's billing good. person and really involved with, Hey, you know, can you teach me what you're doing <laughs> and, and help yeah. me figure out, you know, where I wanted to stand with insurance and what a good fee would be. And so I, ha I had a good year to kind of get a sense of what I was getting into. And what surprised me was. I'm actually really good at all those things. And I didn't, I think that's where I learned. I do have a business muscle. I found myself thinking like, well, I could do this paperwork better. This is too long yeah. and hard to understand and yeah. kind of drafting my own paperwork anyway. Or I realized, you know, I like being in charge of my own schedule because sometimes you get clinical information about yeah. somebody who continues to cancel or, you know, X, Y, and Z. And so I realized, well, why am I paying somebody a cut of what I make to mm -hmm. do all these things that I actually enjoy doing and I'm pretty good at doing? So that was confirmation for me to, I, I can do this on my own, you know, just go ahead and do it. Really good. So there was a learning curve, but kind of pleasantly surprised, it sounds like that, hey, I, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. I can do this. I can save myself some money and using the time with the group practice to kind of learn the ropes mm -hmm. on how to be successful and transition that into a private practice, which is really not that much different. You're doing it by yourself. Right. Um, right. Really smart. You know, there's also, you know, for those that like myself, who are not necessarily that thrilled about some of the billing processes or, or some of the practice management things. There are great billing product, you know, products and software management tools. We actually even offer um, some of those through our, our partnerships through Triad yes. that folks can go on and learn more about. And again, practice management software, billing programs. They can really facilitate a very effective and very efficient private practice. For those of you that are not like Aaron, more like me and find themselves <laughs> needing some of those things along the way. I'm uh, glad you said there, that. Yeah. Which is the good news. <laughs> by no means you have to be good or like right. doing paperwork to do a private practice. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of colleagues I have that have a bookkeeper and they just pay them a very minimal fee or, you know, there's a lot of ways you can delegate that if you yeah. still want to do private practice and you don't, you don't love paperwork. Yeah. 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 That's good. You know, sometimes in our schooling too, we are given an idea of what various aspects of one's, uh, what one's practice is going to entail. But it can be different when you're actually out there starting it up. What are some of the things that you may have learned in school, but found yourself having to correct when, let's say, working in private practice? Maybe it's even something to do like with an intake process or so. Yes. Yeah. Actually, I was thinking of an intake process. So because I'm someone who likes paperwork and crossing my T's and dotting my I's, there we go. yeah, I, I found that I needed to be a lot more loose with the intake process because in yeah. real life, I'm, I'm sure a lot of our listeners have seen this in their early training as well. And in real life, a lot of the clients are just like bursting with their story, right? That takes yeah. so much courage to come in, to schedule that yes. appointment. They have mentally prepared what they need to say. And so sitting down and doing a really structured intake interview, the first couple of sessions often just doesn't really happen. Like it, and so I've learned to be a lot more organic with the intake process and, and get the information I need, but, you know, let the client lead and really share their story. And I can learn a lot of information through their story. So, so really not doing that by the book as much, I think works better in real life. 
And I, I think just in general, being more flexible was something that I learned, like, especially working with kids and teens. Sometimes there's an extra sibling, you know, a toddler that needs to be in the therapy room or in the waiting yeah. room. And so having toys and options for them or, you know, allowing yourself to have a parent session, even if there's a screaming toddler in the room, it's okay. Right. Or sometimes, especially with families and kids, the schedule gets reworked a lot. You know, they mm -hmm. have something that comes up or the, the sibling is sick. And so having some open spots in my schedule to reschedule throughout the week and having options for the families, they seem to really appreciate that. And it goes a long way in building and maintaining that rapport. So I think in summary, it's just real life is a lot messier than what we're trained. And so being yeah. adaptable and trying to meet your clients where they're at goes a long way. I really appreciate that. I think, you know, for those ECPs listening in or those that are working with ECPs and you want to encourage them in specific ways, you know, we come out and we're eager and we are earnest and we want to do it right. But sometimes it's not that necessary to do it in the ways that we've always maybe done it. I, when I was at the hospital, we, we took Medicare as a hospital, not surprisingly. So Medicare would come in and they would review our notes to make sure that they were done. And we had lengthy, lengthy, lengthy notes with, like you're saying, these things needing to be done, but it sometimes would interfere with some of the earlier parts of therapy. We worked around it, so it didn't, but it can. And so this mm -hmm. idea of just when you first start out, you know, be organic and let, let these things happen. You can always fill in the boxes and get the information you need later on. But like you're saying, oftentimes people are just burgeoning with things to come in and say it. So they've been holding this for a very, very long time. In fact, most people don't realize what it takes to make that phone call yeah. to a therapist to come on in. For us, it's what we do every day and we are welcoming and excited about them coming in to see us, but we're not oftentimes remembering that, man, to make that phone call to come in is significant. Mm -hmm. There is a ton of stuff coming in. So this idea that you take it in that way, kind of organically, maybe streamlining in a way that really works for you, I think is a great suggestion. Mm -hmm. Really do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about how you envisioned your practice when you were young. When I was uh, in school, I was going to be an English major and then quickly changed that when I realized that I wasn't getting the best grades in my, in <laughs> my English classes. I had more red, red corrections than I had black ink on my paper. But I, I, I saw in my second year the movie Ordinary People, Timothy Hutton, Mary Tyler Moore, Donald Sutherland, and a phenomenal movie about a family in crisis. And I said, that's what I want to do. And it just, I, and I got a quick vision and my whole schooling and my whole construction of my private practice was around what I saw that family, Judd Hurst was a psychologist, saw, saw them do. And it's a great movie. Everybody wants to watch it. But how might you advise, and how did you even think about it? How might you advise the early ECPs to think about envisioning what they might see themselves doing in, child, in, in, in a child therapy practice, much like what you're doing? How can they envision yeah. that? Yeah, and we, we all answer that just kind of by describing a little bit more of the ins and outs of what I do and where my thought process was. But I, I think maybe we'll start with just setting up the room, right? So because I treat basically five to 25, I split my room in half. And so there's half of the room is like a normal therapy oh, sitting cool. area. And then behind the couch is like a play mat where you can sit on the floor and there's like a bear that's as big as I am <laughs> and toys and a whiteboard that's super low to the ground. And so there really is this kid's section, but then there's also a sitting area for college, college adults, or even, you know, teens. And they're kind of like in between and they don't know where to mm -hmm. go. Just having the option to sit on the couch, like an adult makes them feel very empowered. And, cool. and it, you get some clinical data that way too, which I actually have an example later on that we'll We'll get into that it kind of explains that, but it, I think it just lends itself to options and then also convenience, right? So again, if there is a toddler that's screaming and you're consulting with the parent about their older child, the toddler can just play behind the couch and you can talk to the parent. And so I think just having options and flexibility, even in how your room is set up can be extremely oh, helpful good. to make things easier. Also, especially with families and kids, I think it's important to set up your practice to allow for the extra work that you are going to need to do or you typically do for teens and kids. Okay. So maybe it's getting a release of information for the school as part of your intake. So it's just there because I'd say like, you know, three fourths of the time you're going to be calling the school. Maybe it's setting up an extra fee. If the parents want you to observe at the school, setting up a fee for calling teachers, calling pediatricians, there's usually just a little bit okay. more casework with kids yeah. and families. So having a set fee 
which I think is hard, or at least it was hard for me to do coming out of training to say, Hey, my time is valuable. And I'm going to charge X number of hours for each 15 minutes that I need to call somebody or send over paperwork or something like that. And families are usually really understanding as long as it's reasonable, but that adds up, right? Like those extra calls from the parents during the week or needing to check in that, that adds up. So being able to charge for that. I've also noticed Family sessions tend to run long. They just do. And so if I could have known this earlier, I would have started earlier, but setting up longer time frames for family sessions. So instead of trying to get it in 45, just have a you know, 90 minute block and charge extra and, and yeah. say, Hey, there's, there's multiple people in the room. This is going to go yes. long and I'm going to charge more. And they're usually fine with that. You know, so just, I think just adapting the fees, the structure, the room to what you actually need to happen can be really useful and make your job a lot easier. Some tips that I would add in would be when I started out, I got a lot of my toys and art supplies from discount stores or oh. had all my friends and family look at yard sales or right. if you have friends and family with kids, they're like, we would happily give you like half of our toys. <laughs> right. um, and then once you're up and running, you can get the good stuff. You can pay more for quality things. So that can be helpful. And then I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but there is an ebb and a flow with private practice. You don't have a steady income. You don't have a steady paycheck. And at least with kids and teens, it really slows down in the summer because of vacations mm-hmm. typically it slows down in the winter and it really picks up in the fall and the spring fall. I think because people are going back to school and it's a natural okay. time for issues to arise. And then, yeah. you know, we all have a lot more energy in spring and people are motivated to work on things in spring. So having an emergency fund in your business of about one to three months of profits so that you don't have to stress during those months. You can just pull from it in the slow times. Yeah. Yeah. And one last thing is I would say enforcing your cancellation fee, have a cancellation fee, especially with kids, they get sick, things have to change. And I've noticed sometimes therapy can get put on the back burner with Mm -hmm. sports or arts and crafts or choir. And so enforcing your fee, make sure that your priority and then you're not just getting irritated and frustrated that you continue to be canceled on. And yeah. I give everybody a freebie as a reminder, because, you know, a lot's going on with families usually. So, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll, you know, if someone gets the flu or something, I'll say, hey, you have one freebie, but just as a reminder, yeah. next time I have to charge you and, yes. and nobody's had a problem with it. It's really good. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Behavioral and mental health professionals provide critical support to our communities in a time when our communities need it more than ever. But they need support too, to continue their education, to connect with colleagues, and to advance their career. And so we've launched Triad, the hub for behavioral and mental health professionals. At Triad, you'll find education, community, and career resources for both current and aspiring behavioral and mental health professionals, all curated specifically for you and all for free. Visit us at hellotriad.com slash BHT to register for your free professional account. Again, that's hellotriad.com slash BHT. Come join the community today. You know, I really love, these are some guys, these are some gems right here. These are really, really good. And this is what truly, and this is what makes one's private practice, a really great experience to be involved in and doing. Also, one one of the things I I love that you're saying, Erin, is that we we have to value ourselves as therapists. Somewhere along the line, we did a show on this one time around where we almost are conflicted, almost like there's this moral angst that gets kicked up around charging for what we do. Yes, it's so odd, but yes. (laughs) It is so odd. And for some reason, we're supposed to be, you know, kind of almost like martyrdom is supposed to be, you know, the goal in some ways. But when you think about it, when I go into Safeway for a bag of groceries, that's their commodity. That's what I pay for. It's a bag of groceries I walk out with. Our commodity as therapists is our time and our expertise. The two things you're saying right here, and those need to be valued in the monetary amount put to each of those things, our, our time and our expertise. And people are going to benefit in life-changing ways from the things that you bring to them. So ECPs, you're talking about this, really hear in Aaron's story here, this encouragement to value what you do, what you've been training for, the lives you're going to change, and the things you're going to help relationally with people in their lives, and really lean into that. So those are some great, great tips there. You know, as you were talking, you were talking about people in your room and how you break it all up. And I know in child therapy, you may be naming a child as the identified patient, But the child is really only part of a larger system. And how might you encourage ECPs 
coming into child therapy to see the child within the context of their family system. And do you incorporate parents into the treatment process in any, in any specific ways? Yes, I kind of set the stage at the beginning. So I pretty much express it, even though the child is who I'm seeing, the results of treatment will last longer and be more effective if the family is involved. What I end up doing is the younger the child, the more frequently I have parent updates and just sort of get the parents used to that. So maybe it's, you know, anywhere from five minutes or 10 minutes before every session with the younger child, because I can't pay attention that long anyway. So it's a good use of the time or with teens, it might be once a month that I'll have a call with the parents or sometimes have them come in once a month, just for their own session, depending on what's going on. And so I kind of set that stage where it's where I say, Hey, I'm working with your child or teen, but if I need a family session, I'm going to let you know if I need just you and the team together to talk about something, I'm going to let you know. So I set that expectation ahead of time. And I think it takes a lot of the pressure off the identified patient. So I love to say yes. that in front of them where it's like, this is kind of a family topic. It's not just about yeah. your child. And sometimes it's fun to use the room in that way, where if everyone's really focused on a young kid, I'll just tell them to go behind the couch and play and just focus on the parents as an intervention (laughs) to say, this is not their problem right now. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one thing I do. I know you've talked about even uh, sometimes folks will go into into, uh, child work because they may not like working with adults, but it doesn't sound like that's necessary. Yeah. Yeah. I had that thought too. When I was first starting out, like, you know, applying to grad school, I was like, Oh, I love working with kids. And I don't really like working with adults. I'll I'll be a child therapist. And it took, you know, like half of the first class to realize, Oh wait, I'm going to be working with parents. I got them all. Yeah. I was like, Oh man. So yeah, there, there is actually what helped me. I don't know if this will help any of our listeners, but it helped me when I'm having a hard time with parents to think, think of them as a wounded teenager, right? Because Anytime you're having a hard time with a parent, they're just feeling defensive. And, Mm -hmm. and like, I imagine it must be the hardest, most vulnerable thing to admit, Hey, there's something that my kid's struggling with that I cannot fix. And to come to a stranger who looks way younger than you and probably, you know, like I, for example, look like I'm probably, you know, 19. And so for them to ask for my help with their teenager is a lot. And so thinking of them as a wounded teenager and trying to figure out why are they feeling defensive? And it's usually just fear or shame or something totally understandable. It really helps me connect with the parents better. And I've noticed if progress is stalled with my clients, sometimes if I just say, all right, I need to talk to the parents and bring them in for a parent session and really get into, you know, what's going on with you guys. Are you having any kind of emotional block about your child? You know, that often opens up a lot of progress so yeah. the parents are really key, I think, in most cases to seeing progress and maintaining it. Really good. I, I, I love, again, we're kind of uh, reemphasizing almost kind of empathically when they're making that first phone call or when they're coming in, it's vulnerable to admit, hey, there's something going on that I don't know how to sort through or work through and I'm looking for some help on the outside. And I think the idea though that you're saying is, hey, we can, with the parents, we can kind of normalize and validate and talk about the universality of some of these things that are real common, you know, to kids and parents, teens and parents, and to normalize this process and kind of destigmatize uh, what seems to be a problem. It's just, hey, these are just some growth opportunities that we have as a family. Let's find some ways through them. We can find a way and make a way. We can just hang in there and stay with it long enough. You know, as you're saying that, I'm, I'm thinking that, and I mentioned this earlier, that, you know, we come into this field earnestly and, and, and eager to help. And sometimes we enter into and conducting ourselves in therapy in such a way that it may not match maybe Mm. where a patient is, even though we are well-intended. When you look at your early beginnings, do you recall a time when looking back, you see yourself having had to rethink what you were doing and maybe kind of adjust to be more therapeutic with the person you're working with? Yeah. How much time do you have? I have so many. (laughs) I know. I I think that's what uh, being a therapist is, is always learning to do it better. But yeah. Yeah. One, one example I think comes to mind is I I remember a, about, I think seven or eight year old boy came in and had, he had a lot of, not a lot, but some trauma in his history and he was very parentified. So he, you know, was acting like a 15 year old and had to take care of his younger sibling. Like just a lot had happened in the family where he had to step up. Yeah. And I was early in my training and like very eager to do play yeah. therapy because how fun is that? And I had just started getting training in it and, you know, he's the right age to do that with. And so I was like, 
okay, let's do this. <laughs> but he was not interested in anything playful at all. Didn't want to do art. Didn't want to, like, I tried everything. And I, I think I pushed a lot, like looking back, I should have, you know, taken the hint earlier, but I was very like, let's do this. And he, well, all he wanted to do was talk. And so he would just sit again, that, that room setup was kind of similar where there was a chair he could sit in. And so he just sat in the grown up chair and just like, you know, his hands perfectly folded on his lap and perfect yeah. gentlemanly posture and just talked Little to man. me and yeah, like I swore he was probably 16 year old in a seven year old's wow. body. So I had a supervisor who's wise at the time. I was like, just go with it. Like that's that's where he's at, meeting where he's at. And I was like, put the play and the toys. And anyway, <laughs> right. so I let him talk and we probably, I think it was a good, I don't remember, you know, 10, 15 sessions maybe where we talked like that. And I kind of treated him, matched his age and matched his content. And you know what, by the time we ended therapy, he was playing on the floor oh, and awesome. we were playing cards and we were, awesome. you know, playing with stuffed animals. And I realized, well, that's progress for him that he can act age appropriate, right? Like mm -hmm. normally you would see a kid that way outside of therapy and think, oh, wow, they're so well adjusted and mature, but really it was trauma and he needed to act like a kid and let his guard down. And so it was kind of like, felt like backwards progress, but it, yep. it helped me. And I always remember that when I have a new kid is just don't assume, <laughs> like let them explore the room and figure out where they feel comfortable and go from there. That sounds even really, as you look back and even diagnostic, you know? Yes. Of, yes. Very diagnostic. And where his work needed to be, he kind of needed to reclaim his age and himself and, and his age appropriate interactions and how nice to start where he was at and then therapeutically regress back to where he, he gets to being and, and gets to enjoy being. That's really nice. I like that. I found in my early times being earnest, like you described, I, I, I wanted to help so much. Sometimes I would make premature interpretations mm -hmm. uh, or try and draw connections when someone wasn't ready or there wasn't a, really a readiness for that. And things would kind of stall sometimes. We go, yeah, that's nice. That, that, that sounds good. And I can see how that would work. But there wouldn't be anything that would kind of drop that could then move us forward. So, and then I, I like what you said, it was being patient. And trusting the process and letting the patient kind of lead us where we need to go as we kind of gently shepherd that process. So yeah, that's yeah. a great story. That's a great story. You know, yeah. all ECPs have this journey in front of them as they exit their schooling. Are, are, are there any experiences that you've had that you could identify for them to foresee and plan for as they transition from school into their professional world? Mm -hmm. I remember what surprised me the most and if I could speak to myself at that time, I think what I would share is just, there's a huge transition from yeah. being a student to being fully licensed. And I, at least I didn't think about it very much because it's like this finish line that we're trying to get to for five, six, seven years, yeah. you know, of finally being licensed and being done with those ridiculous exams and, you know, having yeah. all this freedom. But then when it hits you, it was pretty disorienting for me because, you know, I've been a student most of my life and to not yeah. have school, not have classes, not have a supervisor, not have that safety net anymore. And to suddenly be able to call myself a doctor and a licensed yes. doctor, you know, like that's a huge identity shift and in a positive way, but it is very unsettling also. Mm -hmm. And there's also so many options for the first time, because for all those years in your training, you don't really have that many options. You need as many hours as you can. You'll take any client. You have to go to school to certain, you know, you, you, you're funneled into this process to get to a certain point. And then when you get there, it's like, oh, now what, you know? And so I remember saying yes to too many things when I first got licensed, because <laughs> let's be honest, I was tired. I was burnt out. Like yes, most people are. Right? And I was like, oh, somebody asked me to be a TA. Sure. You know, or, yeah. oh, I, you know, somebody wants me to do a little research for them. Sure. For free. You know, and I ended up, and, and it took me a few months to really settle into, wait, I can say no. Like if this doesn't yeah. help me or further my career, or I'm not interested, yeah. or it doesn't pay That's enough, right. like I'm able to say no. Yes. Yeah. So I think yeah. maybe I guess the advice would be know that you can say no and that you can also say yes to a lot of things, but also give yourself permission to take some time to adjust to that transition because yeah. it is strange, you know? I was going to ask you that actually you just kind of led into the next kind of area of interest that I had of if you could give a word of encouragement to our colleagues that are right here behind us coming up, coming into the professional lives, some of what you just said right there, you know, uh, be selective, decide how you want to practice. Mm -hmm. Be kind of gentle on yourself. Recognize you might be a little burned out. Anything else you might suggest as kind of a word of encouragement to them? I think reach out to people that are like three to five years ahead of you because Good. 
it can be really grounding to know, oh, oh, I will have energy again one day, <laughs> or, yeah. oh, I, you know, maybe they'll, maybe they'll give you ideas for something that you didn't think about. That's not your typical linear path, like teaching or private practice. Maybe there's something else that you didn't know about. And that's good. It, it can just be helpful to see options ahead of you. Yeah. Yeah. And also not isolating. Cause I think when we're overwhelmed and burnt out, the, the easy thing to do is just feel like we're the only one. Yeah. I think, I think what you said earlier too, comes back to me right now as we kind of sit with this question of, you know, what, what are some things that we can build in? I think that you talked about before, maybe a consultant or a mentor or a mm -hmm. group of, of, of similar ECPs starting out in, you know, together and they kind of form this cohort of here we go into this new world and can we do it together? So I think those are all good things. Are there some, are there some resources? Let's kind of shift a little bit. I know we're kind of beginning to wind down, but are there some resources that uh, you might suggest that ECPs consider as they come into their professional lives? Yeah, specifically for private practice, one of the books that helped me a lot was Building Your Ideal Private Practice by right. Grodsky, I believe. Okay. I don't know how to pronounce his name exactly. Yeah, It'll yeah, be in the show notes, I'm sure. Yes, um, it will. Yeah. So that book was helpful just to dream and envision how many hours a week do I want to work and what, how do you set fees and all those things. And then right. if you're not a paperworky person, but you want to manage your own paperwork, Paper Office for the Digital Age is an excellent right. resource. It is a little costly, but it saves you so much time and making your, like, basically they have paperwork for you that you can download and use for your private practice, which is wonderful. I mentioned this earlier, but I think that one of the biggest resources for me was talking to people that were two or three yeah. to five years ahead of me and doing what right. I wanted to do to, to right. ask. Like that's where I got most of my practical questions answered and they helped me be encouraged that I could do this. And it's actually not as hard as it seems like. Really good. You mentioned a book by Pope and Vasquez once upon a time. Um, Can you give us that name, that title again? Yes. How to survive and thrive as a therapist. That's right. That's right. Yes. Okay, so that good. one's encouraging as far as, you know, self-care and work-life balance and making sure really you good. don't end up in that strange black hole where you're making weird decisions because you're so disjointed from everybody. That's a really yeah. good one. Very good. Hey, if folks want to get in touch with you or learn more about you and your practice, uh, how can they do so? I think my website is probably the best way. So it's Perfect. dr as in Dr. Aaron Elmore, E-R-I-N-E-L-M-O-R-E.com. Really good. Really good. Well, Hey, we appreciate you kicking off this ECP series for us and sharing some of your experiential gems as you've been in this field and doing some really right things. It's been awesome to have you and we sure appreciate you being with us. Thank you, Aaron. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. It's been great to have you back. We also want to thank you, our listeners, for being with us. We always appreciate you being a part of our show and we'll look forward to having you next time on Behavior Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community, and if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.